super fast foiling racing machines. This is just full action, high drama. <laughs> Exhilarating, exciting, intimidating. <laughs> but it's really more like a spaceship than a sailboat. The boat just jumps alive and it just takes off. They can run away on you like a wild horse if you're not careful. I never feel like this before. The buzz is just, it's electrifying. It's serious adrenaline sailing. This is a boat that'll bite you. G-forces going through the boat is incredible. It's a mix between being scared and a lot of thrill. If you make an error, you're going to flip it over. This is absolutely new territory. Flying around in an F-50. Here we go, boys. Probably one of the coolest things in the world you'll do. Come on. It's been 10 years in the making. A high-performance, one-design catamaran that has more in common with a fighter jet than the traditional concept of a racing yacht. The F-50 is the weapon of choice for Sail GP, a new racing series with six national teams competing across five iconic venues, Sydney, San Francisco, New York, Cowes and Marseille. Broadcast live to a global audience. At stake, the honour of winning the season-ending match race final and the crown as first-ever Sail GP champions. Sir Russell Coots is Sail GP CEO, multi-America's cup winner and driving force behind the introduction of the foiling concept to catamaran racing. Foils are carbon fibre elements that generate lift and for high-performance catamarans have literally taken racing to a whole new level. The foiling catamarans have redefined sailing. These F-50 catamarans, they would beat the 115-foot boats that raced in the America's Cup back in 2010. They'd almost be going twice the speed. Well, I think foiling is the biggest change in our sport, certainly in the last 30 years. It's uh, really a quantum leap in the performance of a sailboat, and it's amazing how fast the wind can make these boats go. They're going three and four times the speed of the wind, which is a really hard concept for the average person to understand. It's just how do you go faster than the wind? We've got foils in the water. We've got foil up in the air. So the wing sail is a super efficient airfoil, essentially. The whole goal is to keep the boat ripping. Once you get going and all that drag on the hull is reduced and you're up foiling, and then you've got the wing sail in the air, you know, it's a pretty efficient setup. Now it's a different game because we're sailors, but also we're pilots. And you're flying in um, 30 centimeter of water. If you go above, you crash. If you go below, you're slow. So yeah, it's a fine line. It's game time, Sydney, Australia, and the season opener for the Sail GP fleet. What a sight. Six boats sweeping across Sydney Harbour. At every event location, the teams compete in a series of fleet races with the top two progressing through to a match race final. Coming up. Let's race. These boats are designed to fly. Yeah, pop, pop. And again, very, very close. Jump, 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 jump. It is the Australians this time around who are heading to the finish line in front. Tom Slingsby's Australia, exploiting home advantage, cruise into the season's first match race final. Their opponents, Nathan Altridge's Japan. Nice work there, guys. And then there were two. It's uh, something of a shootout for glory between Australia and Japan. Straight up on the foils. So, first blood to Tom Slingsby yet again, and the Australians rounding the mark at high speed. Really isn't anything between them at the moment. That competitive fire driving them forwards. Japan with it all to do. Tom Slingsby, his fairy tale is complete, and fittingly, the colours of this inaugural Sail GP in Sydney are green and gold. We have our very first Sydney Sail GP champions, Australia Sail GP team. Australia, the green and gold machine driven by Tom Slingsby. This is the most complicated and challenging uh, sailing I've ever done in my life. This is a boat that'll bite you. 
My crew will never take their foot off the accelerator. Going hard here. When you get the boat right and it's on rails and flight control's working great, it's like no other feeling I've ever had in sailing. Japan, helmed by Olympic gold medalist Nathan Alfridge. The F-50 is a one design boat, so all the foils, all the rudders, all the wings, everything's the same. And so the only reason why one boat will go faster than another is because of what the people on board are doing. Go, boys, go. And Alfridge knows his team better than most. That's right. Ian and I have spent the best part of 10 years sailing together, so we know what each other's thinking without having to talk about it. Luke Parkinson's been sailing with us as well for five years or so. So that makes for a really good dynamic. If the, each person doesn't do their role properly, um, performance suffers. USA and the youngest skipper in the fleet, Roten Kirby. Stuff happens at a pretty high speed. The pace of the game now has changed a lot, so you've got to make decisions and communicate at a pretty high pace. It looks easy. They're not easy to sail. The sailing team wins the race. It's not one guy. It's, it's very similar to football in that if you don't have a good offensive line, the quarterback's going to get sacked and you're not going to get the ball out to your receivers and you're not going to score points. And when you get it right and you sail well, that's the team. Fully loaded and ready to race, an F-50 weighs in at close to two and a half tons. But it takes five athletes, all at the top of their game, to bring it to life. The driving force of the boat, the helm. Driving in a straight line, you've got a number of buttons on the wheel, so I've got the twist grips which control the flight of the boat, so I can fly the boat, lift it up, lift it down. Um, at my feet, there's a number of buttons, so I can drop the daggerboard with a foot. Um, there's a bunch of buttons which control the rudders and I can also adjust the pitch of the boat. And then when we go into manoeuvres, I've got the wing sheet in one hand, I've got the wheel in the other flying it, and then I have to drop the board. So kind of like one of those circus guys who's you know, tapping your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. Pushing performance to the maximum, the wing trimmer. The boat's not performing at its target speed. It's up to me to make a change to the setup of the sails and the wing to get the boat performing as, as fast as possible. The wing is very dynamic. It's really, really moldable. Um, you think like an airplane when it's about to take off, how they change the shape of the wing. We can move it super, super quick through enormous ranges to keep the boat flying with exactly the right amount of power. Flying the line between sea and sky, the flight controller. As a flight controller, my role uh, is uh, to keep the boat uh, out of the water. I can say now uh, I'm more a pilot than a sailor. We've got control over both dagger boards. We can control the rudders. We can pop the wing. You know, you don't hear too much when you're doing a great job, but you're the first to know when you muck it up. The human power plant of the F-50, the grinders. My job as a grinder is to be the engine for the boat. I help trim the wing sheet in and allow the boat to accelerate. You need really fit guys up the front. We can see loads from anywhere from 100 kilos through to about 500 kilos in the wing. As a grinder, we're pumping our arms the whole time and heart rate's up there, up at 160 or 180. You know, you want a Ferrari. You want a finely tuned athlete that can just keep producing power and wattage. Round two, and Sail GP heads out west to do Battle on the Bay in San Francisco. And they are smoking 31 knots just off the start. This is game oh, on, and it's all about Team Japan. From the gun, Nathan outproduced Japan in dominant form, winning all three of day one's races in the most challenging of conditions. There's a bit of yelling and screaming going off on the boats, which you can probably hear on the onboard comp. They are currently doing around about 38 knots of boat speed. Team Great Britain in the flying way too high. Bang! GBR, despite less time in an F-50 than many of their competitors, take a fast track to the front of the fleet, winning their first race of the season. Great Britain over the line first, a scream and down in front of the crowd. In a repeat of Sydney, Australia face off against Japan. Here we go, three, two, one, and we are racing 40 knots, five, 10 metres apart. This is on this race. Both boats, nice and tight. Oh, it's very close to contact. Team Australia have absolutely bashed the Japanese. In towards the massive crowd for the full glory 
Tom Slingsby, take a bow. You've just won here in San Francisco. <laughs> took us right until the last two races to actually hit our stride and uh, you start from scratch in a match race so uh, we're able to win that, win the series, we're stoked. From its earliest evolution, through every stage of the process, the F50's relentless development continues to push the limits of design, all to create the fastest racing yacht on the planet. I think the best thing to compare the F-50 to is a modern fighter aircraft. You have extremely complex control systems. It's built out of the highest end composite materials. You're pulling G-forces. You know, the sailors want the fastest, quickest, most advanced boat they can get their hands on. That's what you make. As the control system gets better, the designers can make the foils more unstable, which makes the boat go faster. So it's sort of like a chicken and the egg. You, you make the control system better, which makes the foils faster, and you just keep going up and up and up. With each generation of, of sailing boat or technology, we've been creating a, a smarter boat. There's roughly 150 different sensors on the boat. We're looking at 2,500 channels. Everything that moves is, is measured, so every foil rake angle, every hydraulic pressure, every electrical signal. There's almost nowhere to hide in terms of the data. We, we can see everything, and every team can see every other boat. SailGP's data sharing concept is unique in racing, where information is speed. It's incredible to have access to all the team's data, but it makes it quite hard to be honest because there's six boats worth of data to look at, but also the rewards are there if you can interpret and see those little golden nuggets in it all. The technology is incredible, but the teams all race the same technology, and that produces close racing. That's what SailGP is about. This is about establishing who the best talent is. Meet France and the fleet's most experienced skipper, Billy Besson. I have the wheel on my hand. You feel the speed and you feel the, the sea uh, very close to you. The most important thing is to be focused on your job. Everybody has the same timing and the same uh, choreography. Okay. When you're flying, on only uh, two points or three points touch the sea. The balance of the boat is very important for that, and it's uh, uh, magic. It's just magic. China, led by multiple world champion Phil Robertson. The F-50, you've got to give it an incredible amount of respect. Hey, oh, no! We've been given the task to make this team a fully functional and crude Chinese team within four years. Trump, 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 Trump. We're getting there and I know once we get it right, we'll be off. And finally, Great Britain. At the helm, Dylan Fletcher. We're always pushing to the limit. If you go into Barraway and you forget one thing, then that's it, you'll go down the mine and you go from 40 knots to nothing very quickly. There's a lot of trust on our boat that everyone's there and everyone's doing their own job and that's really important. We're not digging in each other's roles, telling each other what to do. It's just, I'll do my job, and then we'll get the best out of each other as a team. New York, and it's showtime for the Sail GP fleet in the heart of the big city. Hold on. Even before the starting gun, high drama on the Hudson for GBR. Welcome to race one, Sail GP here in New York City. And we are off and racing. France are nearly going to go over, they need to save that. Competing in the shadow of one of the world's most iconic skylines is like racing an F1 car around the tight streets of Monaco, as the F-50s react to the sudden surges and shutdowns in wind strength. Australia just got hit by a massive gust, that's very dangerous, bow goes right down. They've got swell to contend with, they've got gusts of wind, oh, bow goes in. Very, very relieved bunch of sailors coming across into this finish line. After a testing first day for USA, with a last-minute crew replacement through injury, redemption at last for the fleet's young guns. Ladies and gentlemen, get up and clap, because there it is. First race win, there we go, in the back. But the season-long rivalry between Slingsby and Outridge is on again. Penalty 
Australia, so Australia have to get in behind Japan. So now he has to slow up, so Nathan Outridge can just go flat out. All that will be running through his head now is revenge, revenge, revenge from San Francisco. Any opportunity Australia have now is slowly but surely diminishing. So here they go. Japan are just about to win here in New York City. GBR hold off a resurgent USA to keep third. But it's Japan who take the championship lead by the narrowest of margins. As a kid, I never dreamed that I'd be racing in New York against the best sailors in the world in the fastest boats. It's, um, it's just an awesome feeling, you know. I slowly sort of realised I was quite good at sailing, but I still never thought that I'd be here at the, the top of the sport. For the next generation of aspiring athletes, reaching the pinnacle of the sport may seem a long way off. But SailGP's Inspire program aims to create a real pathway to success. We launched this initiative called SailGP Inspire. Forging the future is a huge goal of ours. And our core motto is using sailing as a force for good. We're coming to these incredible sailing venues around the world. So one of the things that we're trying to push forwards here um, is a tangible legacy in each venue. And that includes working with a local entity, gifting them with um, hardware and assets that they can then expand their own program. Yeah, you know, it really brings me back to the roots of it all, you know, when I was uh, as young as them once upon a time and ripping around and just, you know, just enjoying being there with your friends and to inspire the next generation of sailors to get into it, it's fantastic. Massively important to get the young guys out there and have a bit of fun and show them the pathway to the, to the F50s. Sailing's different for us now, but it's, uh, it was fun to see all them and they were having a blast, so it was good. In the SailGP fleet, engineering advance is not just limited to the F-50. There's an equal determination to evolve and fine-tune every facet of human performance, too. It did, and it was a good race, but more importantly, I think what was really good was the comms were good for the most part, so I think it's really nice. It's not necessarily be about me teaching them, because these guys are all really good sailors. It's about observing and all learning together and improve on a day-to-day -day or an hour-to-hour -hour basis. My style is to just really try and be that extra set of eyes and ears off the boat. The adrenaline is pumping and surging when these guys go out sailing. So they finish the race and they're just fizzing. So it's a really a big part of my job to jump on board and calm everybody down and remember what the goal is for the next race. That right turn at the bottom was pretty sweet. We could have probably tacked in front of Aussies and blocked them there, you know. Now there's another weapon in the modern coach's armory using the advanced technology only previously available to jet pilots and F1 drivers. The simulator has a few functions. You know, first it's an engineering tool. We can look at the design aspects of the boat and then also it's a training tool for the sailors and the sailors can sail the boat, crash the boat as many times as they want and get in tons of hours before they ever touch the real thing. And with a boat this complex, that's an extremely valuable asset. Another thing we can do is we can have someone who's normally the flight controller trim the wing, or you can put in a grinder and have them steer the boat, and they can get the feel for the boat and understand that position without any risk to actually breaking a real asset. Another bear away coming, bearing away in two, one bearing away now. A good job. Today's project is more about getting an existing team member who's a grinder on the flight control. We want to make sure that we have some backup. It's a really good way to get an understanding of how the boat works before you get in the boat for real. I think we spent about five to six hours here in the simulator today, and it's, it's just like selling the real thing. It's physical and it's really mentally challenging. Coming here and, and giving you know, myself some time on the flight controller, giving some time to Victor on the wing really allows us to be diverse and be able to not only have the ability to sail different positions, but also have more concrete debriefs. Everyone understands all the systems. Everyone's on the same page, and I think it makes our team stronger and better for it. Fresh from a cow's event that saw the astonishing 50-knot barrier broken, all eyes now turn to Marseille and the grand final. Three days of racing and one winner-take-all match race to crown a champion. Australia and Japan trading race wins just metres from Marseille's seawall. 
and booking their place in the end of season showpiece. But the early headlines belong to China, a season long climb up the leaderboard culminating in their first race win of the year. upon us, the day we have all been waiting for since the first race in Sydney. The race is on here, 25 knots of boat speed, and about eight knots of breeze. Not many boats in the world can do that. Here's the French team are leading this race. All the way out. Here they go, the French, have they got it? Yes, they have, they finally won a race. A huge home victory for France as they edge out the USA for fifth place. China take the final podium spot over GBR. And now, the stage is set. It comes down to one one-off match race. That's what we're here for. If he wants to play uh, games in the pre-start, that's fine. You have to be aggressive. We're going to be going for him. I better watch out. When he's got us coming at him, we'll see how he reacts. The grand final is on, and it is Japan on the top end of the course. Outridge and Slingsby muscling their F-50s around the racetrack. Nathan's going to slam one right in front of his face. Japan keeping Slingsby's Australia in their wake. This race is going to go right to the end. There's nothing in it. We're almost on right here. Taking off the laps and heading for the bottom gate, the chase is on. I will. Slingsby building speed. Can Japan get the overlap and force Australia right. to move aside? Keep going hard here. Alright, we've got the inside, I think. Go hard. Go hard. One whole season comes down to just millimetres. And has that been the million dollar move that lost him this race? Slingsby slams the door on Japan, and Australia snatch back the lead. So we're on the final leg now of the championship race, and it is the Australian's Tom Slingsby leading the charge. It's time to get up and party. Australia is the 2019 Sail GP champion. Our team's worked hard all year. We won four out of five events. Uh, we sailed unbelievable all season, and Nathan and Team Japan did an amazing job. It makes it so much sweeter when you win a battle like that, and I just can't wait to celebrate with everyone. Sail GP has its first champions, but get ready when the battle begins again in Sydney, February 2020. Next time on The Spirit of Yachting, one of offshore sailing's true classics, the Rolex Middle Sea Race.